Thanks for tuning in this evening. My name is Kevin Conover. I'm the host of Educate for Life Radio. We broadcast from Southern California down here on K Praise. 1210 AM is the local radio station. And uh, also FM uh, 106.9 in North County. And then, of course, all over social media. And uh, just last week, we had a, uh, an astronomer on, uh, Spike Saris, who was fantastic, uh, just talking to us all about the planets and how they point to a creator and our solar system. Uh, some of the stuff he said was just amazing. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can always go back into our archives and check that out. Uh, the week before that, we actually had a geneticist on the show, uh, Dr. Georgia Perdome, and uh, she talked about how genetics points to a creator. And uh, it seems to me everywhere I look, I'm, I'm looking at evidence for God and for the truth of the Bible. So very, very cool. And I had the privilege of bumping into uh, Pam Aker um, at a homeschool convention that I was at in Missouri and uh, didn't expect that, but uh, it was awesome uh, to get to meet her and um, the ministry Colby Center. Uh, the study for creation with the Colby Center. And um, that's what our guests this evening, let me tell you a little bit about them before, before um, we get to our discussion here, because we're going to be talking about uh, creationism within the Catholic Church, specifically. And, um, and so uh, Pam, she holds a Master of Science degree in biology from the Catholic University of America. She's taught science in a variety of set settings, including middle school and college. And she's conducted research in vaccine delivery using T4 bacteriophage nanoparticles and was also briefly involved in researching novel gene regulation mechanisms. She's published two books, Vaccination, A Catholic Perspective through the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, and also a high school biology textbook that she co-authored with the founders of the Angelic Doctor Academy. And now she works with the Colby Center uh, full-time supporting the doctrine of creation. And then uh, also we have Mr. Hugh Owen, he um, got a BA in uh, uh, honors in history from New York University, an MS in education in, in supervision and administration from Bank Street College of Education in New York City. And for the past 25 years, he's dedicated his life to the service of the church as a writer, editor, teacher, lecturer. He's written numerous books and articles on Catholic, Catholic and secular topics. And for the past 20 years, he served as the founder and director of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation in Mount Jackson, Virginia. And what I was most impressed with by his bio was that he has nine children and 19 grandchildren. So uh, that is quite an accomplishment right there. <laughs> Hugh and Pam, thanks so much for being on the show this evening. It's our joy to be with you. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, um, so I wanted to start off, Hugh. I'm, I'm super curious. Uh, you know, the, it's, I'm, I'm enveloped in the Protestant um, a church and in specifically, I'm apologetics oriented. I'm very focused on creation and all these sorts of things. And this was actually my first time. And, and you know, maybe I need to get out of my bubble more often, but this was actually my first time bumping into somebody uh, within the Catholic church that held, um, you know, to a, a strict biblical understanding um, of what the text teaches in uh, Genesis about a six day creation and, and so forth. And um, it was really a, a blessing to, to be able to talk with Pam and the other people that were there uh, representing the Colby Center. And I wanted to ask you, um, you know, at what point did you, have you always believed in, in creation as, as the Bible teaches in Genesis chapter, uh, you know, one through 11, or was that something that um, changed over time where your perspective changed on that? Uh, can you give us a little bit, bit of background? Sure, well, I really have to go back two generations because my grandfather was a baptist minister in wales in great britain wow and uh my dad was brought up in a, in a in a baptist home very conservative baptist home in wales but he went to university in england in the 20s and 30s and already evolution-based secular humanism reigned supreme mm. so he was thoroughly indoctrinated into that and completely lost his faith in Christianity and became a secular humanist and went to work for the United Nations, uh, became a high up administrator within the UN after 25 years, was knighted by the queen for his work, but retired uh, a frustrated man because he looked at the world and saw that all the problems of the world were much worse than when the United Nations was started 
And so unfortunately, he once again turned to the secular humanist intelligentsia for advice. And they told him that the reason that the UN wasn't making headway in solving the world's problems is that it wasn't addressing the root of all the world's evils, which they said was overpopulation. Oh, Too wow. many people. That's why we have wars and pollution and social and economic injustice. And so my dad actually accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. And he held that position for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in London when I was, when he was uh, just 65 years old and I was just 16. And it was really his death that precipitated my conversion. Um, and uh, about a year after he died, I received the gift of faith. And then uh, I was looking for uh, the church that I should belong to. And when I was a freshman at Princeton University, uh, at the age of 18, I recognized that the Catholic Church was the church that our Lord Jesus Christ had founded and that I should join that church. So I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic in the Princeton University Chapel uh, at the Easter Vigil 50 years ago <laughs> when I was 18. And uh, of course, at that time, there was already quite a bit of confusion within uh, Catholic academia and the priests who received me into the church were actually Jesuit priests who unfortunately, like many other Catholic intellectuals had already embraced evolution and thought that they had to reconcile evolution with the Catholic faith. But um, uh, by the grace of God, I came into the church Church without really being convinced that this reconciliation was necessary or valid. And eventually, um, you know, I, I discovered that the authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church was completely incompatible with <laughs> evolution. And um, because the leadership of the church had actually asked uh, back in 1950 for Catholic intellectuals to examine the claims of the evolutionary hypothesis. And there wasn't really any kind of forum in which to do so. Um, in the year 2000, with the encouragement of my pastor, I founded the Kolbe Center for the Study of Creation to provide a forum for the Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists all over the world who held fast to what is actually the traditional authoritative teaching of the Catholic Church, what was believed and taught by all the apostles, fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers in their authoritative teaching from day one. And, uh, and that's, that's what we do. So that's really interesting to me because, you know, you, you've really... Um you're really swimming upstream in a sense. Uh, you said that, you know, all these academics and all these uh, people, when they, when they joined the church, they felt that they needed to somehow meld evolutionary teaching with the doctrines of the church. And yet that's not something that you, you went along with. How, how did you end up not, you know, there's so many people in leadership and an authority that take that position. How did you not just go along with that? Well, um, I've always been a, a student and a lover of history, and especially the history of the people of God. And one thing that I've learned very, very well from uh, studying the Bible and also studying the history of the church and of the people of God is that this problem of um, forgetting Genesis, forgetting what God told us to remember when he gave us the Ten Commandments written on those tablets of stone. This has been a problem for the people of God for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as I'm sure 
you and and your listeners and viewers are aware, um, if we go back and look at the history of God's people from the time of King David up to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can see that <laughs> there was collective amnesia mm. with regard to the sacred history of Genesis to the point that the pretty much the whole leadership of the people of God went over to idolatry. Mm. They were worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars and practicing all kinds of sexual immorality in connection with this false worship. And it was so bad that, as you know, during the reign of King Josiah, who was one of the few, <laughs> the few good kings that came, came along during that thousand year period, uh, it was so bad that we read in the word of God that Hilkiah stumbled upon the law. They had mm. completely forgotten Genesis to the point they didn't even know that it existed. And it each says man that did what found, was right in his own eyes. You know, he found the scroll of Moses written in the hand of Moses. And of course, when they read it to the people, they were convicted because it was something that was totally unfamiliar to them. Mm. So I see that during the last 100 years, there's been a kind of a collective amnesia mm. within Catholic academia, not only with regard to the sacred history of Genesis, but with regard to our own teaching that was handed down from the apostles. But it doesn't, it doesn't scandalize me. It, it breaks my heart, but it doesn't scandalize me because I see that the same thing has happened within the people of God in the past. And, you know, God didn't say when he looked at all of this idolatry and sexual immorality and, and apostasy on the part of the church, uh, the, the, the religious leadership and the civil leadership, he didn't say, well, okay, I'm done with you people. I'm going to find another family from which to bring forth the Messiah. No, he had promised that the Messiah was going to come from the house of David and he wasn't going to break his promise. And it, we believe the same about the Catholic church. Sure. Sure. You know, so, so yes, we're in a, we're in a crisis of faith, but those who want to know what is our authentic teaching can easily find it out. And, and uh, that's our mission is to make sure that we hold fast to what was handed down. I love that. I love what you're saying there because um, it's interesting to me that you, your emphasis on history, your knowledge of history really is what helped you to have a perspective that no, um, I'm not just going to go along with this because I've seen this because of my study of history. I've seen this mistake um, happen repetitively and therefore yes. I know not to make this same mistake. Right. And exactly. um, I think that's a great, that's something for whether you're Protestant or Catholic, that's something we all have to uh, focus on is the fact that um, we do the, the Bible is ultimately a history book. We need to know our history. We need to know our heritage. We need to know what God has done in the past so that we don't make those same mistakes again in the future. Um, the Bible can't be a light unto your feet, uh, a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. If you don't <laughs> know the Bible, how is it going to light the yes. path if you don't, if you don't know it? And so Absolutely. that's really uh, fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. That's very encouraging. Um, Pam, I wanted to ask you the uh, same question that I asked you, which is, um, can you give us a little bit of background, how you came to your position that, uh, you know, a, the biblical creation perspective, uh, especially as a biologist, uh, scientifically, again, it's, it, you're swimming upstream. There's so many in academia who, who don't hold that perspective. Um, where did you come from? And uh, has that been a tough road to travel um, with your peers, you know, it, it going in the opposite direction a lot of times. Sure. Um, so I, uh, I actually became a theistic evolutionist. Uh, so I, I believed that the world was created through evolution, but God did it mm. um, through reading a creationist uh, high school textbook, because I was looking at the arguments that were being presented in the textbook. And I was a little bit precocious as a kid and, and kind of um, 
really saw that a lot of the things that were presented were kind of superficial. They weren't really very philosophically sound. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if these people are over here making fun of evolution in this way, then there must be something to evolution. And so I just kind of, I, it was almost like a reverse psychology kind of thing. I accepted it based on the bad arguments that I had heard for creation. So and can then I, I ask you about that, Pam? Um, sure. So when you say these people over here were making fun of it, because this is something um, that I find like what you're saying to be very dangerous is to just um, haphazardly treat, you know, the arguments without, because I teach high school students, I teach 12th grade high school students, and it's very important that um, the dialogue is fair, that it's not ad hominem, right. ad hominem arguments or just name calling. Um, right. So who was it when you were growing up that was, that was just making fun of it and not actually giving you good answers? So it was actually my uh, mom started homeschooling us when I was a freshman in high school, way before it was cool. This is back in the <laughs> mid 90s. Um, so, uh, so I was using a biology textbook from a Becca um, publications. And that was where I had, I saw the arguments presented. And prior to that, you know, because this isn't something that's really preached about from the pulpit, unfortunately, no. um, much in the, in the Catholic church. Um, although my pastor preaches about it literally all the time. Wow. Um, yeah, he's amazing. Where do you go to church? I I wanna, we uh, got to get this I, guy's name out there. I, I know, right? Like, uh, I, I'm not allowed to say that on. Oh, okay, on the air. that's all right. That's all right. He doesn't. He doesn't like me to throw him under the bus like that. But oh, um, right. okay. He's he's a great guy, but he he preaches about it a lot. But you know, I hadn't really heard it preached about um, from the pulpit. I'd heard a lot of other things preached about, but. Um, you know, I was reading this textbook and a lot of the arguments were logically fallacious. A lot of the ad hominem, a, a lot of straw man kind of arguments. And, yeah. and I said, well, if, if this is, if this is the best they've got, then I don't really want to, to deal with that. And so I, I kind of, I've carried that forward in my own, you know, work that I do now actually defending Genesis, um, mm. and trying to be very careful and make a lot of distinctions because those distinctions are important. Mm. And if I'm, if, if we're not actually making the proper distinctions and we're not really countering the the arguments on a scientific level that the people are presenting or in, in dealing with them in a straightforward way i mean obviously we know that the theology trumps the science because revealed truth is going to tr trump anything i can learn on a natural level because i'm a fallible human being right mm. but but a lot of people don't still... have you found that a lot of people don't agree with that 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 because <clears throat> you know and in, in the people i've discussed you'll hear people say things like well we have the revealed word of God, but then we have the word of God from nature. And then they'll actually put them on an, a level playing field and they'll say, no, 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 the, the word of God does not trump um, science because they're both uh, God's books. Um, have you ever heard that before? Has anybody ever said I that? I mean, I've, I've heard them described both as God's books, but like when it, when it comes to scripture, I mean, we have the, the tradition of the church, we have the teaching magisterium, we have and, an, you know, official interpreter of that book, if you will, there is no official interpreter of the book of nature. Mm. You know, there's, there's nobody that whose authority I can trust and say, this is exactly how I need to understand this natural phenomenon. And um, it, it's, it's just really, it's, it's not equivalent. Uh, I don't think at all. And when you're, you're talking about something that, that is a revealed truth that has been passed down you know, through uh, the proper authority and hierarchy versus, you know, a, a truth that I'm sort of, I'm, I'm looking at something outside of myself and, and drawing conclusions about it, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's very important um, that, you know, that, that, that there is a, the living teaching magisterium of the church that, that carries on our understanding of the, of the Holy scripture. Um, because, you know, anything that we come to on our, on our own, on our own reason, it's, we, we need to question that a little bit. And yeah. So because like you said, we're, we're fallible. We're, fa we're finite. Our minds yeah. are finite. And so we have to approach things with humility and uh, ultimately um, the word of God is our final authority. Like you said, for those very reasons, uh, because it is the rock we can lean on uh, the unchanging inspired infallible word of God. Right. Yeah. You know, properly interpreted through tradition and, and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, so, yeah, so I don't I don't think that the two obviously are on the same playing field. And but I do find that a lot of people um, don't like the idea that theology is the queen of sciences. And I didn't even like that at the beginning. I used to argue with you. Actually, I'm like, we got to We got to deal with the science stuff first, because because if people don't take these preconceived notions out of their head, they're never going to listen to what we're saying. Mm. But but he pointed out to me, and I think this is very true, that 
you know, we always start and we always end with the theological premises because that's that's what actually is most important. And the very fact that we always start with it and end with it shows the proper order of things. And so I always give my talks in the middle where I take, uh, you know, the the icons of evolution, if you will, and, mm. and debunk the science behind those things. Um, but I actually started kind of coming back to um coming back out of evolutionism in college when I, I learned about proteins and genes. So mm. my primary focus in my, my undergrad was in the area of genetics. I was very interested in, in doing, um, I was actually interested in uh, genetically engineering vaccines. So I've had a conversion on that as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, That's interesting. Engineering and the vaccines, that would, that would be a, that would be a whole nother show, right? It's there. a whole other podcast, right? <laughs> so, um, but uh so that, that was my primary interest in looking at looking at the incredibly complicated way that genetic information is coded in the genome. Mm. And then it's codes for these incredibly complicated molecular structures called proteins. And I can't ha have the code without the proteins that actually build the code. And mm -hmm. I can't build the proteins without the code. So it, it, it was, it's kind of a molecular chicken and egg problem. Yeah. And I think a lot of people look at, they look at, you know, sort of organism sequences and they say, okay, well, maybe I could see how a dinosaur evolved into a bird or imagine how a monkey evolved into a man. But when you zoom way in and you look at the cellular level, you can't really imagine how it non, non-living matter became living matter. Mm. Like there's, there's really, there's no conceptualization of that. And you can't really imagine how you you got this this incredibly complicated information conveying system that that's you know microscopic that that's totally integrated with the system that that builds it you know um, so I started to kind of it, it cracked the facade at that point you know through the natural sciences but it wasn't until I met Hugh um, at at one of the seminars that he gave in a parish um, about I don't know seven eight years ago that then I really kind of came all the way around and I remember him putting up a slide. In his presentation and and he, he talked about what you have to believe about the character of god um mm -hmm. based on what you believe about the way he created and he, he just kind of had two lists you know you had the god of evolution and the god of creation and i i looked at that slide and i realized that i couldn't believe that god created through evolution anymore because of what it says about the character of god because god did not create an imperfect world mm -hmm. and he did not use death and deformity and disease to, to, to somehow bring to some culmination, you know, the, the, this human being that then, then he's somehow infused with an immortal soul. Like that's not how a good God would create. He created something perfect in the beginning and, and we messed it up, Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and that's a very, very, very different God. And it's a very different faith ultimately. Um, when you, when you start living according to that understanding of creation. So wow, that's powerful. Really the theology that converted me in the end. That's really neat. Um, yeah. And that, that is, that's a really um, a, a interesting distinction that uh, because there is a lot of people that believe in theistic evolution, they believe that God used evolution in order to make everything. Um, but, but that would have mean uh, millions and millions of years of death and destruction of animals. The survival of the fittest is brutal. I mean, even oh, yeah. Darwin, Darwin talks about it, um, that, um, that's actually impacted his own faith in God was that he felt that nature was too cruel in order to be able to say that a good God did this. Um, uh, so that's, a, that's really powerful, um, to have come from that, from both the theology perspective as well. Um, Hugh, I wanted to ask you about this also, um, you know, your, the story of your father is such a tragic story, uh, of, of how here he was, a Bible believing Christian, and then evolution itself um, was just the, the, the idea of it was destructive enough to ultimately cause him not to believe in God. Um, was that because he just couldn't justify that the connection between what the Bible taught and what evolution uh, presents? Or is that was, was there something else besides that, that, that drove him away from Christianity? Well, since, since, my last conversation with my dad occurred when I was 15. Mm. I it's I have to do some guesswork about that, kind of putting clues together. But it seems to me that my dad didn't really become an atheist so much as an agnostic. Mm. Um, he, he, like so many others, was content to say that science could explain 
the origins of man and the universe, but maybe there was some higher power behind it all. But, you know, he, he definitely lost his faith in Christianity because he believed that human science could explain things differently than the Bible as understood by all Christians had explained them. And, and that was the case with so many millions of people in his generation and it's going on today. Of course, it's been going on for the last 100 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the root of it is really the unconscious embrace of the false philosophy of Rene Descartes and the Enlightenment philosophers. Because if you look back at the history of ideas, you can see that until the 17th century, mm -hmm. it was the common conviction of all self-identifying Christian theologians that there was a distinction that had to be made between the supernatural work of creation in the beginning, which was a complete and finished work of creation, what St. Thomas Aquinas calls the first perfection of the universe, all the different kinds of creatures, each one perfect according to its nature, all existing together with Adam and Eve and for Adam and Eve from the beginning, at the beginning of time. Mm. And, and, and all uh, self-identifying Christian theologians understood that that was entirely supernatural and that the natural order, what many doctors call the order of providence, only began when the whole work of creation was finished. Well, Rene Descartes was really the first baptized Catholic we call him scoffer with reference to second Peter chapter three, where St. Mm -hmm. Peter is inspired by the Holy ghost to prophesy the evolution revolution and the rise of this false enlightenment philosophy. Descartes the first one to begin to be taken seriously when he says, after leading a very immoral life and dabbling in the occult and leaving uh, Catholic France for free thinking the Netherlands and having these three mystical dreams where he says a spirit of truth possessed him and put him on the path to develop a wonderful new way of thinking that would change the way everybody thought. At that point, Descartes says that one of these wonderful insights that he got from, of course, from some demon in hell was that it's more reasonable to explain the origins of things in the universe, like stars or plants or animals or even the human body, in terms of the same material processes that are going on now, instead of this strange idea that things just popped into existence whole and entire in the beginning. Mm. Now, the Catholic Church authorities put Descartes' works on the index of forbidden books because every theologian worth his salt knew that that was nonsense. You can't explain a supernatural creation in terms of natural processes. But if you look back over the intellectual history of the next 200 years, you can see that little by little, that false uniformitarian naturalism of Descartes and Immanuel Kant and Spinoza and the rest of them gradually insinuated itself into the minds of the overwhelming majority of the intellectual elite of the Western world. And that's what set the stage for whole generations of people like my father to be robbed of their faith. Mm -hmm. Because by the time, uh, by the early 20th century, the overwhelming majority of intellectuals in the once Christian world have completely accepted this idea that things have always been the same and that it's legitimate for natural scientists to study the natural world and extrapolate from what they observe here and now all the way back to the beginning to explain how everything came to be. And yet, 
this is completely false because if we if we accept God at his word as his word was understood in his church from the beginning we know that that is completely false the mm-hmm. whole work of creation was supernatural the natural order only began when the entire work of creation was finished so it's totally absurd to think that we can study what's going on now and extrapolate back to explain how everything came to be. And of course, you can be the smartest person in the world and have the greatest technology, but if you start from the wrong premise Mm. and think that you can figure out how everything came to be by that kind of extrapolation, you may may be the smartest person who ever lived, but you're going to come up with a totally wrong answer every time. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. I I had Lawrence Krauss uh, on the show who says that the universe came from nothing and he has incredible credentials, but, but his conclusion is just absolutely bizarre. Uh, it, it just d- makes no sense at all. Um, and uh, so, so that's, I, I couldn't agree with you more. My guests today are Hugh Owen and Pam Aker uh, from the Colby center for creation. You can visit them at colbycenter.org and I, uh, I, I just think it's phenomenal what you're doing. And uh, I'd love to tell everybody I know about uh, what you're doing. Uh, we have a, a pretty uh, popular um, university here in San Diego, USD. It's a very, uh, very big uh, university. And they, they, I have students that go there and they, they uh, text me or, or call me and, and say, Mr. Conover, that here I am at the Catholic university and they're teaching me evolution is true. And, and I know creation is true. And, and, uh, you know, they're asking me questions about, should I stay, should I even stay in this class? This, this teacher is so adamantly, um, just aggressively, uh, pushing evolution. I'm curious, um, from your experience, um, Hugh and Pam, that since you've been doing this, do you, do you get a lot of hostility within, um, the Catholic church and, and, uh, Catholic academia, as far as, um, because that happens sometimes on the Protestant side that, you know, here we're supposed to be, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes there's a pretty extreme animosity that takes place. Do, do you experience that a lot of pushback from, um, what you're, um, you know, what you're teaching ladies first, <laughs> <laughs> um, what a guy, <laughs> he's always a gentleman. Um, no, so, so I, uh, mostly haven't actually experienced hostility. So I think the hostility depends on the person. Hmm. Um, and, and it's, it's a lot, you know, it's temperamental and it's also just kind of where they're at in terms of how invested they are in their worldview. You know, I've, I've, I've met, I've traveled all over the country, um, since I started speaking with the Colby center a number of years ago, and I've met wonderful people everywhere we've been. And we usually speak to fairly small groups of people, but they're people who come with an open mind and an open heart for the most part. And they might have questions, um, but often they're thoughtful questions or good questions that when people really want to engage, um, it's it's a little intimidating for me. I'm not I'm not uh, an argumentative type, you know, and I'm defending, you know, one of the most argued about positions, I yeah. think, <laughs> in our day. Um, but uh you know, it's, it's, it's been really beautiful just to see how many people are, are actually interested in hearing, um, and hearing about it. Um, and you know, I, I have, I have encountered a hostile person or two. One, one stands out in memory that poor man, I was trying to argue with them about first principles because he was studying uh, the philosophy of science. And he said, well, you know, why, why, why do we care about first principles? Because, you know, X, Y, or Z. And I said, well, we can't even have a conversation at this point. You know, if you're, if you're denying that there are some things that, that we can know, you know, that, that are kind of self-evident, like mm. the law of non-contradiction, mm-hmm. you know, something can't both be and not be at the same time. Yeah. You can't even have a conversation. Yeah. So if you um, abandon logic, you've got a real problem. Then, right. Then. <laughs> right. So, so, yeah. Okay. But Hugh's been doing this longer than me, so he might have some some more stories. What about you, Hugh? Yes, we we, we do encounter uh, opposition, and um, I, I don't hesitate to say that that it's clear from our experience that uh, the devil has a special hatred for this fundamental doctrine of creation. And it, we can see how he works overtime 
to keep this truth from being proclaimed, especially mm. to young people. And, uh, and sometimes it can manifest when um, one of our members goes to somebody in authority, let's say the head of a school, and this person is normally very kind and uh, even tempered. And at the request that the Colby Center be allowed to make a presentation in the school, this person might fly into a rage and order the person out of his office, which is totally out of character. Well, we, we've seen this quite often all over the world, and it doesn't surprise us because we, we have to say that when a person acts so, so much out of character, that there's a, a preternatural element that's entered in to the situation. So yes, we're, we're dealing with an intellectual controversy, but as one of our patrons, uh, St. Maximilian Kolbe always reminded people, this is primarily a spiritual warfare and our, our enemies are Satan and his minions. And they are the ones that are trying their best to keep people in the dark with regard to the truth about creation. Because anybody that understands the doctrine of creation correctly knows that God, who is all good, all loving, and all wise, created for us a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious universe and that when we messed it up with the original sin and our subsequent sins, he came into the misery that we made, took it all upon himself, suffered and died, rose again, founded the Holy Church, sent the Holy Ghost upon her so that we miserable sinners could be new creations in Christ and cooperate with him in restoring everything back mm. to the beauty that it had in the beginning and, and bring it to an even more beautiful final perfection who wouldn't fall in love with a god like that that's that's the proclamation the foundation of the gospel that converted barbarians mm. to the to the catholic faith in the early centuries of the church so devil doesn't want us to proclaim that he wants us to present the christian faith on a different foundation, which is false. Mm -hmm. And this is why we're seeing a mass exodus of young people out of the church, because the faith is being presented to them incoherently mm -hmm. on a false foundation. And as, as it says in the Psalms, foundations once destroyed, what can the just man do? Mm. All right. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That was wonderful. Um, you know, and I, I couldn't, I mean, I, I've, I've been teaching now for 15 years, high school students, and when they get a coherent view of creation and the fall and redemption, boy, their eyes light up and you, it, it is unbelievable what God does when, um, the truth gets inside of them. I mean, <laughs> they're so excited, um, to see how logical, how much it makes sense. Um, you know, just like the Bible tells us, come, God says, come, let us reason together. And uh, though your sins are like scarlet, they will be white as snow. And that, that is, um, they just see it makes sense. And, and I, I tell my students, you know, God has taught us to be attracted to, or he's created us to be attracted to two things, love and truth. And if we come to somebody with both love and truth, it is irresistible um, that, that uh, just, combination is just amazing. So, um, I love it. I love what you guys are doing. Um, colbycenter.org for those of you listening, um, if you want to get more involved and that was my next question for you, uh, Hugh and Pam was, you know, um, Hugh, how, how can people be more involved with what you're doing? Uh, because I, I just want to shout it from the rooftops and, and get more people involved in, in your ministry and your efforts, because, uh, I, I just think that it, it catches fire when people find out about it and they start to learn, um, they grow and they just get excited. Um, what, what can people do to get more involved with what you're doing? Well, first of all, if any of the students enrolled in the Catholic university in your area uh, want to contact us, we'll gladly give them all the support 
that they need. And we, we also have a, a standing invitation to have a public debate with any theistic evolutionists anywhere in the world. Um, we've had that out for 20 years. And amazingly enough, we've only had two takers in that entire period of time. So wow. if anybody can find uh, two theistic evolutionists that are willing to have a debate with us in a public forum, we'll, we're happy to go anywhere to, to do that because that's another, another way, not necessarily the best way, but a, it is a way of getting the truth out there. Um, but what I would encourage people to do who'd like to get more involved, if they really have a conviction of the importance of the true Catholic doctrine of creation as the foundation of our faith, the first article of the creed, I would encourage them to come to the, our leadership retreat we have a week-long leadership retreat every year. Uh, this year, it will be at a retreat center in Ohio. And that is a wonderful place to get a really solid foundation in the theology, philosophy, and natural science that one needs to be able to really defend this truth effectively. And it's also a wonderful opportunity to meet the um uh, other people from all over the United States and even from other countries who also have this commitment to advancing our mission. Um, but uh, there are so many wonderful resources that are available now through our website. We have a, a DVD series in which Pamela features prominently, which took us a number of years to complete. And it is a very comprehensive defense of the traditional teaching of the church on creation uh, from the perspective of theology, philosophy, and natural science with wonderful teachers like Pam and Father Chad Ripperger and, and others. Um, and uh, we have a dedicated website for that DVD series, www.foundationsrestored.com. Can you and repeat anybody that can one more go, time, Hugh? Can you repeat surely, that website surely. again? Yes, www.foundationsrestored.com. And anybody can go onto that website and view the first two episodes of the 13 in the series for free. And then um, if, if you want to get the DVD series, you can either get the physical DVDs or you can get the online streaming so that you can watch the whole thing on the website. And I should also say, because you may have viewers in, in other parts of the world um, or people who are just in, in difficult economic circumstances, we uh, operate on a suggested donation basis. So if somebody wants to take advantage of any of our materials and they cannot afford the suggested donation, as long as they promise to share the information as much as they possibly can, we will gladly give it to them for whatever they can afford to, uh, to donate or nothing at all, if that's, if that's all that they can manage. Um, so I would say go to these websites. Um, if you're really zealous for the cause, contact us about uh, taking part in the leadership retreat. And um, I, I think that will cover the waterfront pretty well. And, and any students at any Catholic institution who uh, are being taught that evolution is a, is, is a fact or that Catholics must believe in it, we can provide them with all the resources they need to know that this is not true and that the true authentic authoritative teaching of the Catholic church is to take God at his word in the sacred history of Genesis. That's fantastic. Well, we're just right about out of time here. And uh, Hugh and Pam, I just want to thank you so much for being willing to come on the, uh, the program this evening. Thank you for it's having us. Joy. Absolutely. And I am really going to look into seeing if I can arrange something over at USD here in our local uh, Catholic university for a debate or some sort of a co conference. Um, I just yeah. think that would be very um, impactful and um, that it would, it would go a long ways in, in really um, moving people's hearts and uh, ultimately uh, drawing people into a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's fantastic. Yes, I can, I can send you a letter from a, 
a university professor who with another university professor organized a debate um, for us in Kentucky in 2014. And um, it's really an excellent letter that explains how he set up the debate and it, it gives a very good sort of template for setting up uh, a debate. So if anybody is, is interested in pursuing that notion, I'd love to share that letter with you. Yeah, I'll definitely get that letter from you. And, um, and uh, we'll have a Protestant set up a debate at a Catholic university for Catholic creationists. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Right. And um, oh, I had one other thing I was going to ask you. Uh, I mean, there's so many more things we could talk about, I think, um, because I, I do want to touch more on the science aspects too. But, but, um, uh, oh, are, are you willing to travel uh, to San Diego? Is that uh, something you guys Absolutely. would be, yeah, would be willing we, to do? We travel yeah. pretty much all over the country, anywhere that we're asked okay, um, and invited to go. And so even if you can't organize a debate, we've, we've given um, presentations on college campuses and at parishes um, okay. all over the country. So if, if there's interest, we'll go. Great, great. Okay, and um, that's colbycenter.org. For those of you listening, my name's Kevin Conover. My guests were... Pam Acker and Hugh Owen of the Colby Center. My website's educateforlife.org. You can check out all the resources I have over there as, along with many, many hundreds, over a hundred different podcasts with, with uh, people who love Jesus all over the world and how God has impacted their life and God is using them to impact others. So thanks for being here with us this evening and uh, we'll be back again next week. You guys have a great night. God bless you. <laughs>